Hey guys, I'm Nick, co-founder of Allura, and we're building a self-improving decentralized AI network. Um, before we get into things, I just want to level set a line on sort of end-to-end uh, -end view of the AI stack as, ha as how we see it. And we kind of see it as these four core layers. This is somewhat of a simplification, but fundamentally the, the decentralized AI stack, the AI stack in general, can be broken up into data, compute, intelligence, and execution. And we think that like with other decentralized networks, this end-to-end -end system will be realized via a kind of modular construction. I think blockchains are, are incredibly powerful coordination mechanisms for turning potentially nebulous resources into more tangible digital commodities. And when you're coordinating disparate networks of individuals around different actions, it's already a complex undertaking on itself. And when you try to build monolithically, that complexity compounds. And I think that's why we've seen the blockchain stack modularize. I think that's why we've seen such a rapid rate of innovation and progress in things like DeFi. It's because of this modularity and the, the ability to build uh, very tightly scoped, highly composable building blocks that get stitched together. And so when we think of Allura, we think of the kind of intelligence layer of the stack we're building and kind of turning intelligence itself into a digital commodity. Um, and the problem we're trying to solve is, is this kind of fundamental problem in AI of siloed machine intelligence. There's many different models in the world and they're not very kind of composable or compatible with one another. I can't merge model A and model B to create a, a mega model that represents the intelligence of both. And this is a real problem because it means that these large monoliths with access to the most kind of raw resources of data and compute will continually making the, the better models. And so what we're trying to solve with Allura is through decentralized networks, a way for models to kind of learn off of one another and become more composable or compatible in a decentralized setting. And so that's what Allura is. Allura is a, a network where many different models can learn off of one another in collectively optimizing different ML objectives. And the output of the network is a kind of aggregate inference or an aggregate model output that consistently outperforms any of the individual models within that network. And in doing so, you've created a kind of commoditized version of intelligence itself and significantly accelerated the rate of innovation of machine intelligence itself. Um, and another way to think of Allura is kind of this abstraction layer for intelligence. The same way Bitcoin is kind of an abstraction layer for power or other networks are abstraction layers for trust or compute or things like this, Allura is this abstraction layer for intelligence, allowing people to access intelligence in the kind of best aggregate form of intelligence through the network itself as opposed to interacting with individual models and needing to go through the processes of, of deciding between different models in different domains or contexts. Um, and just some quick background on who we are. So when we first started the company, it was originally called Upshot. We're now called Allura Labs. We're building the Allura Network. Um, we were doing a bunch of research in this really new field of mechanism design called peer prediction that leverages information theory in a pretty interesting way to incentivize people to be honest in the face of subjectivity. So enabling people to reach consensus on the answers to subjective questions. That's important for a bunch of different problem spaces, the Oracle problem more generally, and it's also useful for designing decentralized networks around especially nebulous resources like intelligence. And then as we were building this out, we realized that humans as inputs to these systems were too inefficient, they're, they're too inaccurate, uh, too incompetent, I guess, to uh, support many real world tasks. And that's when we shifted to building some of the earlier AI X crypto infrastructure, especially in long tail market settings. So uh, AI powered price feeds for long tail assets, AI powered derivative infrastructure, et cetera. And what we're doing with Allura now is taking that early work we did around subjective consensus mechanism design and all of the learnings and infrastructure we've built in the AI crypto space over the past three years to build this kind of collective intelligence network or self-improving decentralized AI network. And this is kind of how the network works uh, at a high level. Um, the, the kind of core mechanism of the network is what we call the inference synthesis mechanism, and it's a way of stitching together different model outputs in a productive way to create a more performant or more intelligent network level output. And so the, the general flow is consumers ask a, a given topic. A topic is kind of like a subnetwork in the system. It's a very tightly scoped uh, ML objective that model creators uh, kind of coordinate around and are attempting to collectively optimize. A consumer would, would ping one of these topics asking for some AI output, 
and two flows are happening. One, these kind of inference workers are responding to that request with uh, inference that is being assessed or weighted based on uh, how well it optimizes the core objective function in that topic. And simultaneously, forecasting workers are predicting the loss that's going to be realized on those inference workers uh, as assessed again by that objective function. And they're, they're over time learning the context, the different domains, et cetera, in which different inference workers within a given topic perform well or perform less well um, to produce the, the most accurate kind of predicted loss. And so as these things get stitched together, you uh, establish weights across the different inferences developed by different workers based on a kind of approximation of a Shapley value across different models and produce a, an output that over time increasingly outperforms the individual model's performance within that topic. And then there's a, a kind of second or third type of actor called reputers who are tasked with actually evaluating the performance of different models over time. So they, they take some ground truth, they take some kind of basis or validation set and assess the performance of the different uh, uh, workers as, as assessed by or as calculated by that objective function. Um, and and I, I guess one, one thing to note here, I haven't, I haven't looked at this presentation in a while, um, is because workers are just sharing inference through the network, the network can support open and closed source models. They're not revealing the weights of their models, they're not revealing any kind of proprietary information of those models, and we think that's important for supporting a wide number of use cases, and we'll get into it later, but especially kind of use cases in financial settings where maintaining that proprietary alpha or the proprietary information of your models is especially important. Um, and the key to this mechanism working is really around context awareness. We've done a bunch of work around this, but it's that introduction of the forecasting worker that allows you to realize a lot of the outperformance at the network level relative to the individual workers in the network. And so we can see some simulation results here uh, in five predictors. They're, they're inference workers, but they're working in a time series prediction task. Um, the best uh, predictor is predictor one and they've achieved a log loss of uh, about negative 3.3. Uh, and so that's pretty good. They've, they've, uh, if we didn't have forecasting workers, we would weight them the most heavily as this kind of base set of predictors and then pr produce an inference that achieves close to that performance. But it's over time that these forecasting workers sort of learn the different contexts in which different predictors perform well in this time series prediction case. Maybe some models are especially competent in, say, volatile market conditions. Other uh, models are, are more competent, less volatile market conditions. And these forecasters would learn that over time and uh, adjust their, their predicted losses to uh, uh, kind of represent that. And what we see in this, this bottom figure is that with the introduction of aggregators or, or forecasters as, as they're called, the, the best forecaster achieves a, a loss of around negative 4.4. And so that's a, around 33% better than even the best model in the network because they're learning the context in which different workers outperform other workers in the network. And additionally, we can see that even the worst aggregator, the one who is taking kind of, the, uh, who is weighting uh, contextual awareness uh, least sensitively is still outperforming even the best inference worker within that network. And so it's this, this kind of element of context awareness, this additional dimension of performance where we really see outperformance at the network level in this kind of setting. And then another nice property of this is when we interact with, with AI today, it's a very kind of model-centric paradigm. I'm saying I'm going to use GPT-4, I'm going to use Claude 3 for some task, and I'm asserting that that model is going to be the best in every domain and every context that I'm using it in. Um, that's not the case. I don't think there's ever going to be a single model that is dominant across all domains. And when you, when you align things around given objectives or given topics, you start to move to this objective-centric paradigm of interacting with AI in that I care about this ML objective, this evaluation criteria that matters for my application or for my use. And then this underlying set of ever-changing models is being productively coordinated and stitched together to produce the best possible output as that. And you can think of this as kind of analogous to the move from transactions to intents of moving from specifying a specific set of uh, state transitions to achieve some objective to just specifying the intent that you care about at the end of the day. 
And as we move towards an objective-centric paradigm of interacting with AI, a similar thing will unfold is in, instead of interacting with specific models, we'll interact with specific ML objectives that we ultimately care about and ultimately satisfy our needs, either in use and application development, whatever it is. Um, and so just to recap, these are sort of like the four core properties or features of Allura 1, collective intelligence. I think that's pretty simple. We're bringing together many different heterogeneous models to produce a more intelligent kind of network level intelligence. And because of forecasters, the model is, or the network is kind of learning over time. And so you achieve this property of kind of iterative learning at the network level. Additionally, you achieve iterative learning at the model level as well, because each of the individual models in the network are learning the, the weights that are being assigned across other models in the network and using that to improve or inform their future outputs. Uh, third, contextual awareness, as we talked about, is kind of the key to stitching together heterogeneous instances of machine intelligence in a really productive way, in a way that outperforms any of the individual models within that network. Uh, and then lastly, as we talked about, because the workers are only sharing inference within the network. There's a level of privacy protection that supports this kind of closed source uh, model participation within the network. Uh, and then I just quickly want to go over some initial focus areas. So I think as we think about where this network is most applicable at the application level, we see a lot of financial applications as the initial kind of uh, like verticals to tackle. I think as we're talking about crypto and AI, Crypto is largely a financial innovation, in my opinion. It's, it's found most, if not all, of its product market fit across different financial settings. And AI in financial settings is also much more mature than, than some of the newer types of generative AI as well. And so I think a lot of the immediate value within this intersection of crypto and AI will happen in various financial uh, settings and verticals. So we'll quickly go over some of these. One, AI-powered data feeds. So this is, this is pretty broad, but I'll, I'll focus specifically on kind of AI-powered price feeds for long-tail assets. This is what we've been doing historically at Upshot for the past few years. Um, but when we start to move into the long tail of assets where crypto like in DeFi admittedly really shine in, in codifying certain market interactions to enable the support of more long tail asset categories, we still lack a, a kind of robust and accurate source of price discovery for these assets. Uh, they don't change hands very often. And so these transfers of ownership that act as price discovery events for other asset classes often don't happen enough uh, for that to be the sole source of price discovery for many different assets. And AI can be used to take into account many other pieces of data outside of the market itself, as well as upsampling market data in productive ways to produce re near real-time price feeds for a much broader set of asset categories and sort of equipped with... Uh, a price feed, you can start to build a bunch of really interesting primitives in, in decentralized finance, lending protocols, perpetual systems, synthetic representations of assets. Your, your kind of scope of compatible assets in financial settings expands significantly with, with AI as a, a kind of supplement to that price discovery mechanism. Uh, second, this is again pretty broad, uh, but AI agents for DeFi, I think today DeFi has showed us uh, the power of decentralized composability, the power of kind of codified financial operations, but it's still very primitive and, and uh, I guess, unexpressive. And with AI, we can start to leverage this highly deflationary form of compute that can take into account many different pieces of information in an incredibly efficient and effective way to start executing more complex or advanced uh, trading strategies, liquidity provisioning strategies, manage uh, different DeFi parameters and lending systems or perpetual systems in a far more kind of advanced or efficient way. And so I think AI inter intersecting with DeFi via the form factor of agents built on top of this kind of collective intelligence network will represent the sort of next explosion of innovation uh, and, and sort of uh, experimentation within decentralized finance. Uh, and then lastly, this, this is risk modeling, uh, especially as restaking becomes a, like a larger part of the space, represents a larger percentage of the space's capital. The complexity of risk when you're reapothecating a like pool of capital across many different heterogeneous networks becomes incredibly complex. I think we saw this, some of this play out uh, earlier today or last night. Um, and AI in, in this kind of decentralized form factor can 
can offer us a really robust tool for making sense of all of these really complex risks and develop kind of adequate hedging vehicles or, or other kind of uh, financial primitives to help protect against that risk and as such protect against this, this mass of new networks that are, are merging on top of uh, a kind of source of restaked capital. Um, and just quickly launch timeline. So we're in testnet phase one right now. We're about to launch testnet phase two in the next week and a half mainnet shortly after. And in the meantime, we're just uh, onboarding workers, model creators. That's really our top focus right now is bringing together a kind of critical mass of, of machine intelligence onto the network. The network gets smarter the more models there are. And so that's, that's really our top priority. And we're also working uh, with a bunch of kind of top tier applications and different networks in the space and bringing this source of collective intelligence to different kind of parts of the crypto space. So I think that's it. Thank you.